Um, since about 2005, our poll campaign started. This was in response to uh, the vice pres then Vice President Dick Cheney's new energy policy, um, which was basically to build a whole lot of new coal plants. And this was going to get us on board oil and make everything great. But we knew there's no way we could build 200 new coal plants um, and be able to actually stop climate change. Um, and so we set out to, to stop every single coal plant proposed. And a lot of people told us we were crazy, that there was going to have to be sacrificed communities, um, that there's no way we could, we could challenge them all. Um, I am happy to say we won almost every single one of them. I think about two broke ground. So um, we were really excited that we were able to stop that coal rush. Um, and then uh, once we started getting a handle on the new proposals, we started tackling the existing coal plants. So America has about 500 coal plants in the country. Um, we started in earnest in 2009, um, working to close them and transition them into better uh, fuel sources. Uh, and the first one um, was in Oregon. Uh, and since then, we, we have put on a retirement schedule 188 of the 500 coal plants. Um, so we're doing good. Uh, we still have 300 and some odd more to go, um, but uh, it was, it's been kind of amazing um, how we've been able to really bring down the coal industry to its knees. Um, when we, I first started, it was, this coal was the place to put your money. Uh, now that they're at junk bond status, almost every single coal company. Um, and so we've really brought an industry um, to its knees, and in replace of that, we are seeing a huge increase in, in wind and solar energy in the United States. Um, right now, in a lot of markets, wind and solar is competitive and priced in, in natural gas. Um, so this is a huge thing. Um, we are seeing um, the last few years, the majority of all new um, uh, energy sources online being wind and solar which is, is really good for us, especially in the beginning when we were shutting down coal, the rush was to go to natural gas, and now we've seen the problems that come around from natural gas and fracking um, and the emissions that come from that. And so it's really good to start to see wind and solar be at the same price level as natural gas. Um, it's gonna be really helpful. And we're, we're already seeing a trend now that where these Right now, it's being subsidized by the government, and as those subsidies start to relax, it's still keeping pace. Um, and so, this is really good sign for us um, in uh, in our efforts to bring on renewable energy and replace of coal and natural gas. And then here, um, in the states, we've been making a lot of progress um, at a national level. Obama, President Obama, has his new clean power plan, which is the first ever carbon regulations. Um, for existing power plants, this is huge. This is huge. This is going to help us shut down a number of dirty fossil fuel plants that we need to shut down in order to address climate change. Um, and uh, 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 again, um, internationally, uh, President Obama and um, uh, Prime Minister of China um, have come together to have an agreement on reducing global warming emissions. Uh, these, China and U.S. are the two biggest polluters in the, in the world, so it's a huge deal that we're coming together um, to, to address this. And in fact, for the first time ever, China's global warming emissions dropped last year, uh, which is completely what nobody expected, right? When, when President Obama and China did this deal, um, China's agreement was, well, we'll peak out at two, 2030, right? So we can't promise to start cutting, but we'll make sure that there's a point where we stop, right? And, and that's actually already, I think, obsolete. They're already starting to see emissions drops. It's only a year. We'll have to you know, see what the trend is, but it's encouraging. Um, and last year, internationally, global climate change emissions stagnated. This is the first time that's ever happened um, when the economy is going well. Now people will argue, is the economy going well for everybody, but at, a, at an international level, it is going well, and climate change um, emissions stayed stagnant. So this shocked a whole lot and made a lot of international press. Um, and so I think going into 
Um, UN talks around climate change at the end of the year in Paris, and we do this every year or every two years, and, and it's always bad. <laughs> the rest of the world comes together to address this, and the US and China go, no, no, we don't want to do anything. Um, and I think that this year there's a lot of hope um, based on what um, the US and China are already saying that we could possibly come together on an international treaty around um, climate change emissions. Um, so there's a lot of hope, right? There's a lot of hope. However, you know, we also have, you know, this, uh, this environmental disaster that is looming and it's not gonna wait for the politics to be right and it's not gonna wait for us to be comfortable. It's just happening. Um, and you know, we have a Republican controlled House and Senate that um, really, 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 really wants to undercut everything that we've been doing. Um, so it's really important for us um, to have these, these rules implemented and that they stay implemented. Um, and I think that we can do that as long as you know, the public is really paying attention and keeping an eye on things. Um, the EPA has all the legal authority to do what they're doing, which is great. It's already been challenging the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says they have the legal authority to do it. Um, and so we feel like we're on solid ground for continuing this progress, even if we lose the presidency. Um, but you never know. So, make sure you vote. Um, <laughs> I would say, you know, here in the Northwest, it's really interesting because as the coal industry and the oil industry are starting to fight for their survival, they're seeing us as a, real, as a gateway to an international market. And so we kind of created this problem by ending our reliance on coal, um, that now the coal companies, this is their Hail Mary pass, um, and they want to be able to ship it to India, China, and other, uh, other countries. Um, and so Washington and Oregon have been faced with a, a series of coal proposals um, to export coal out of Montana and Wyoming into um, a broader world market. Uh, and so in 2011, we were faced with six proposals across Washington and Oregon. We have stopped four, um, but we still have two left. Um, and the two big ones are, one is up just north of Bellingham. It's at a place called Cherry Point. It's actually um, Native American, Lummi Native American grounds, uh, which brings in a whole new aspect to the destruction that we're creating. Um, but they want to ship 50 million tons of coal every single year uh, out of there. And then down in Longview, which is kind of between um, Centralia and Vancouver, um, another 44 million tons is proposed down there. Um, when they first did uh, this first round of hearings, Department of Ecology, the Army Corps, the regulators that are kind of overseeing the environmental review of these projects, um, we've so far turned in I think um, for almost 400,000 comments and have had, um, I think around 10,000 or so people come out to hearings across the region on this. So it's the biggest environmental um, review that's ever been done. And the other side likes to say that, oh, this is the biggest environmental review. We don't deserve this. But we say we do because this is a huge, huge project and it's going to lock us into exporting this dirty energy for years and years to come. Um, and all of the trains that carry this come right through our town here. Um, in addition, now we're seeing oil proposals. So there's huge oil exploration going on up in North Dakota and in the tar sands of Canada. You all may have heard about what's happening up there. It's the new oil boom. Um, this oil is super dangerous, super volatile. Um, and they're transporting it in trains to refineries, and they're coming through here, but they're going all across the United States. Has anybody heard about the oil train explosions that have been happening across the United States? So these trains explode with the Bakken oil in them, and um, they are exploding at an alarming rate. Uh, we've seen, I think, around four or five explosions so far in the last year um, here in America. Uh, it it is a huge. I mean, oh, if I had a video, I should have had a video of it. They are just Google it. It is like these huge.
huge, massive explosions. And if anything like, and so far we've been really lucky in that they haven't been happening in populated areas, except for the first one, which was in Canada, and it wiped out a whole downtown of a city and killed 50 people. But so far in America, um, it hasn't been in any population centers. If it happened here, it would wipe out thousands and thousands of people. Um, uh, the blast zone of these trains is about um, a quarter of a mile. So it's, it's big. Um, and right now, there's no regulations on these trains at all. Um, so you have coal and oil trains coming through um, our communities, polluting, um, causing traffic, uh, worsening climate change, and then on top of it, they sometimes explode. Um, and so uh, we're very concerned uh, with the oil proposals. There's one in Vancouver for a brand new oil facility down there um, that's currently going under environmental review. Um, but then also all of our refineries up here in Anacortes and Cherry Point um, are looking at expanding to be able to take on this oil. Some of them already are. Uh, so we're kind of we're kind of the thin green line. This is what Bill McKibben of 350 says. The Northwest is the thin green line in between um, stopping and keeping coal and oil in the ground and just having it instead exported um, to a to a world market. Um, so we really have a lot of um, ownership on um, a big piece of whether or not we stop climate change right here in the Northwest, which is exciting and daunting all at the same time, but I choose to go with these. Um, <laughs> and then in what just recently happened, and I don't know if anybody's been following this, but um, Shell Oil, which is the major driller for the Arctic, um, wants to start bringing their rigs down here to our port to fix them. Um, and the port has agreed that they can bring their big monstrous rigs here um, to fix them and the community is uprising against that. And so there's some work being done right now um, on trying to get that stopped. And in fact, the rig is on its way from the Arctic right now. And um, a number of Greenpeace activists have been um, we're sitting on it for what, like a week, Mary? Mm -hmm. Like a week. I mean, out in the middle of the Arctic, <laughs> out in the middle of the ocean in the Arctic, um, sitting on a rig trying to stop you know, it being um, brought here. But they did have to get down because of climate reasons. Um, but it's expected to be here soon. Um, so there's protests, and the Sierra Club, along with some of our environmental partners, has sued the port. Um, for their approval of this project. So that's kind of a little bit about what's going on here. We have a lot of good stuff happening with um, uh, Governor Inslee's climate change bill that he's putting forth. Uh, this would be a carbon price here in Washington State, which would be huge. Um, we have some legislation going on right now um, to try and limit the amount of these exploding oil trains that go by. It ain't easy to stop these oil trains, but we're trying to get around the edges as much as possible. Um, and then we will have um, big public comment periods on the oil terminal in Vancouver um, this summer, and then in the fall on the Longview Coal Terminal. So there's a number of opportunities to get engaged moving forward. Um, and then we also have some events coming up. We have Earth Day here, where you can find out more about a lot of these issues. Um, that's gonna be on Wednesday, Earth Day, the 22nd, you have a flyer. Um, and then there's also a rally coming up on um, the Shell Arctic uh, uh, proposal, um, and that's going to be at Myrtle Edwards Park on Saturday, April 26th at 2 p.m., which I can tell you more. Oh, it's Saturday. Mm -hmm. oh. I just take what people give me. <laughs> Okay, Sunday, April 26th at 2 p.m. Um, so that's kind of just a nutshell of where we're at, where we're going, what can be done, but I'd like to just open it up now and we can talk more about it if y'all are interested in doing that. So what makes these, these oil trains much more dangerous, or they seem to be more mm -hmm. dangerous than traditional? So it's the type of fuel. It's lighter and it, combust, I think, at like 60-something degrees. 
So it's a, it's a huge difference between conventional oil um, in the volatility of it. Um, and then when these trains derail, because they derail all the time, trains derail all the time, it's, it's kind of insane how much they derail. And so when they derail, it's just impact and explosion. Um, it just depends on how big of a derail it is. So for instance, one of these trains derailed in Magnolia, um, but it was only a couple of cars and it was going really slow, so we dodged a bullet there. But if it was, go if it was just going fast at a regular pace, we could have been in some real trouble. Um, so it's the type of fuel, it's just more explosive. You said it's 60 degrees. Yeah, it's, I can't remember exactly, but it's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's an insane level of where it, it, it can bust. Yeah. That might not be up to date, but uh, at one point, Matt Mead, the governor of Wyoming, filed a lawsuit against, I think, the state of Washington right. or something, claiming that uh, by not allowing coal terms, Constructing commerce. Right. Um, do you have any information on that, or, or how that will? Yeah, so that's true. There's uh, Wyoming is trying to sue us for not allowing these coal exports, and it came in response to stopping um, one of them along the Columbia River down in Oregon. Um, we just uh, we're, we just won on that project uh, late last year, um, and so I they're suing. We don't. Our lawyers don't believe they have a case. Um, it's, uh, but you know, it's always a threat, right? Um, international commerce suits um, <coughs> aren't fun to deal with, uh, but we think that we have all the the, the legal backing for it, um, and so and so does uh, the uh, the environmental department in Oregon. Um, they spent years making this decision. Um, and they wanted to get all of their ducks lined up in a row so that they couldn't be sued, and they're pretty confident that they're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, has enough of the uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, leaked out to say how uh, these challenges will be handled out of that Yeah, so um, the TPP is a trade deal right now that President Obama is trying to get um, between us and a number of um, uh, Pacific Rim countries, along with Mexico and Canada, um, and these trade deals, while you think, oh, trade is good, you know, um, they have a lot of secret, nasty stuff in them. And this deal um, would, in, would empower, um, they call them investor state dispute settlement courts. And basically what it is, is it's a way for a company to be able to sue a country over its environmental laws, its labor laws, um, so that they can make a profit. And if we enact a law that stops them from making a profit, they can sue us. Um, it has to be from another country. So um, the, there is one coal company, um, Amber Energy, that's from Australia. So there's some risk there. Um, but, you know, I don't know if this is lucky or not, but, you know, most of the coal companies are American and they can't sue us for our own laws. Um, so we're, we have some good strength there. However, fracking laws are a big deal, um, and they can be very much challenged because a lot of the fracking companies are from overseas, um, and we're seeing a number and number of cases of fracking laws being challenged in these courts. Yeah. I was just wondering if it's very difficult for a coal company here to somehow incorporate in another country, and then become a company in that country. Yeah, I mean, I imagine that's a possibility. I don't know enough to be able to give you a really educated answer on that one, though. Make it sound so positive. Uh, <laughs> 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 well, I firmly believe that we are, we can do this. I mean, we are really smart, ingenious species, and I think that we, we have all the technology behind us, it's just political will. And, you know, from where I started to now, which hasn't been that long, it's only been six years working on this issue, I've seen enormous strides and changes happening. Um, there's still a really strong contingent of people who don't believe in global warming and climate change and want to do everything they can to stop it. Um, but. I feel like the 
momentum is on our side. We were able to get a lot of momentum over the last six, seven years. Um, and I think it's going to be hard for them to turn back the clock on it. Um, but I never underestimate the power of, you know, the old white men <laughs> that seem to be in our Congress, that seem to be really, really pushing to roll back all the progress that we made. We'll see. Uh, but I, I also think about uh, people of India and China who yeah. try to improve their country mm -hmm. and try to develop the economy mm -hmm. and change from old style technology to more modern technology, which may include using uh, North American coal instead of the dirty coal that they have in their countries. So, so for that reason, I still think exporting coal and commerce with North America and India and China is still positive. We should, we should uh, trade with them so they get not only coal, but also oil and iron so that they can build and develop their economy and their society. So, uh, so all of the arguments are important. The transfer, the handling of all these products are dangerous. It's, but, but I think also the necessity of having of those countries having these products uh, is also very important, and we should always keep that in mind. So we, so there should be no shutdown of trade and commerce between our two countries with these products. Uh, so I would say that all coal's dirty. So our coal has a little bit less sulfur dioxide. That's it. Same global warming emissions of our coal and their coal. Um, and our oil is, is, I mean, it's all dirty. It's all dirty. And so I don't think that the mining and shipping and transfer of small amounts of our coal into China make a hell of a difference in their air pollution. Um, what makes a difference in their air pollution is switching off of these dirty fuels. And they're doing it at an, an impressive rate. So Beijing and Shanghai, and I'm gonna not pronounce this right so somebody can correct me, Guangdong, is that how I say it? I don't know. <laughs> um, are all getting off of coal as early as next year. Um, these are huge major population centers. So there is, this is, this is an opportunity to do something better, do something different. And the people in China and India are protesting these coal plants in huge amounts. I mean, they make our protests look like a drop in the bucket. I mean, you see 30,000 people coming out to protest a new coal plant in China. Um, the answer to their air pollution problem is not a little bit of a cleaner coal. It's about a new society and a new way of doing business. And we have the technology, we just need to implement it. So you mentioned that this past year, China's emissions had gone down for the first mm -hmm. time. So what caused that? So I know that there have been protests, but were there any, um, was there any le legislature that was passed to, to push that through? So How did that they don't really out? do legislation <laughs> there. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs> so they just started shutting down coal plants. Oh. That's what they started doing. But they're also building nuclear plants too. Mm. I just want to add that I read in uh, one of the Andean countries, Ecuador or Peru, they're getting electricity up to the remote villages through solar power. I mean, and not trying to build plants up there. Yeah, building a box and then wiring it out is very, you know, it's an old way of thinking about how we do electricity. It's the easy way of thinking about how we do electricity. So our utilities are big. You like to build a box and just send wires out. Um, but I think we are at a cusp of a new way of doing business um, for energy supply. And yeah, I was just in Costa Rica and wind farms all over um, the place, uh, helping to power small rural communities. Yeah? Also, regarding that oil rig, the yeah. Shell oil rig coming to the well, yeah, it's right there where yeah. the port is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, these, these 
when it comes, you will see how huge it is. Uh, it, everyone should go and look at it because these are huge kind of, uh, structures. Um, but they do need maintenance. We know that because a lot of these rigs explode and have fires, like in the Gulf of Mexico, where people were killed. Uh, the workers were killed uh, on those structures. Um, so maintenance and uh, updating of these structures are necessary. They're not going away. They're not going away. And the best thing is to bring it here, let, let the workers uh, do the work necessary to improve the thing. You can debate policy, you can debate regulations, but any, really any attempt to impede the work on that rig is actually not only counterproductive, but dangerous to the workers who have to live and work on those structures. So I see a lot of this opposition to that rig as generating some of hostility to that whole project, which is which is legitimate, but you really have to let the workers who live and work on that rig have more, have safer conditions and let the work be done proper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. I do hear you. I mean, as long as they're operating, they need to be operating in the most safe manner possible. Um, I think what people would argue is, does, is Seattle the place that promotes this type of uh, work? Um, and we think as, as our reputation for who we are here in Seattle, that it doesn't fit in with um, what we see as the future for the work that we're doing. Um, so that's, that's all I could say. Um, I am not working on that project. Um, other folks are, though, I think, um, uh, maybe here in the back, too. Um, but uh, maybe come out to the rally and see what they have to say. And, uh, talk to some folks down there and see where they're coming from. It's my understanding that they, this rig is a, to, to test drill. And really the risk is that if they do start actually drilling and they had an accident, there would be no way to clean it up up there, that we really should not be drilling in the Arctic at all. Right. Well, that's definitely what we should not be yeah. doing. <laughs> we should not be drilling. Be and, and, and they haven't been able to drill, I think, the last three times that they've tried to do it. Um, and so the folks here are saying, why should we help them get this drill in an operating shape so that they can start drilling up there? We don't think that that's our role. I've heard that uh, wells they drill in the Arctic are, uh, I don't know if this is just speculation or what, but there's like a 75% chance that they'll develop a leak. Um, is that true? Is, that, is there something behind that? You know, I wouldn't be able to tell you if that's true or not. I would just be able to, just like you, see the amount of accidents that are happening all over the place, and is that a risk we're worth taking in the Arctic? I mean, so don't really, I don't believe it's a risk worth taking anywhere. I mean, we just, like this gentleman said, we just had an explosion in the Gulf. Um, and, you know, after Deepwater Horizon, everybody said, Oh, trust us. Now we figured it out. It's cool. We've got it. And they just keep exploding, keep dying. We keep putting oil into the water. Um, and so I don't believe them when they say they can do it safely. Do you think by shutting down access to this rig that it will stop the project? I, I believe that it can at least slow it down. Yeah. Um, so from a personal point of view, I don't agree with that. Um, Drilling is the solution that we need to be taking at this point. Um, and there's better ways. But I did read an article um, that was from a science website um, about a new technique where they, um, it's like this mesh that picks up oil but allows water to go through. So I was wondering if there's, if you heard about it, mm -hmm. if there's any um, plans to incorporate that kind of technology. I have not. I have not followed that. Um, I am guess happy that they're finding new ways to be better but still like I mean you saw when Horizons got I mean they're sopping it up with four or five paper towels it's like how can we be doing this sort of work and not have adequate response plans and so I don't know about this mesh I'd love to hear more about it um, I don't know if it's the answer or not 
it's definitely not the answer to all the uh, destruction and climate pollution that yeah, comes from it. Yeah, that's something, it's something regardless if we have that technology or not, that, you know, there's a smarter way where we, we shouldn't be drilling, but I hope that eventually we have something like that to yeah. help the cleanup. I mean, I would really just like to see us be the indigenous people that we have been in the past and see like a new deal proposal for America. Let's get off of this dirty energy. It's gonna create jobs and it's going to better the planet. I mean, the Department of Ecology estimates, estimates that for Washington State, we're gonna lose $3.8 billion in economic profits every single year starting in 2020. This is not just about saving polar bears. This is about saving our economy and our children's future. You mean because of carbon emission? Yeah, because of all the health costs, uh, sea level rise, all the impacts that we're gonna see. I mean, we're gonna see drought. I mean, already Snoqualmie was not open this whole year, right? We're gonna see drought. The wine industry is already planning on moving out of Washington State. In, the, in, in their future plans to go to Canada because they won't be able to grow it here anymore. Um, we're talking about fishing. The fishing um, has been impacted huge by ocean acidification. So really, um, a lot of industries that produce a lot of jobs for us are under threat. Um, and it's the reason why when we're working on coal and oil, we're not just working with the traditional environmentalists, but we're working with doctors, we're working with fishermen, we're working with um, uh, agriculture, and uh, it's a powerful coalition of folks that are trying to stop these projects. And in fact, with the oil, which is really interesting, is they have the actual terminal workers that are opposed to it as well because they're scared to death of handling it. Um, so there is definitely some unique coalitions that we have um, uh, against this, and it's why we're winning so far, because we are going up against Peabody Coal, Arch Coal, BNSF Railroad, we're going up against the big guns, and we're winning. And it's because of how many different lives uh, these proposals actually um, impact. Do you know, just as you're listing all the industries, do you know um, if the timber industry is on board? I'm just wondering if they've been impacted no. with, with pests and stuff. No, no, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it'll be a cold day in hell when the timber industry is working with us on anything. <laughs> physicist in the late 1800s. Oh, wow. yeah. His last name was Linnaeus, I believe. And um, I mean, it's, it's actually, it's pretty basic. Oh, Linnaeus was a botanist. Uh, I think we gave the, the Latin names to No, this is a, a different, a different. <laughs> um, but they, uh, I mean, it's actually pretty basic physics and chemistry. And he recognized um, that as, you know, they were moving towards more uh, forms of fuel that put off more carbon dioxide. Uh, he, he postulated that eventually, if we did this to you know a certain degree of the magnitude of the atmosphere, <laughs> yeah. and he actually came up with uh, some recommendation or hypothesis of what he thought the the warming would be. Yeah, was that going off like absorption spectrometry, which is pretty sure I knew it. Yes. Yeah. And it's actually, I kudos to him. His his guess was not too far off from what you know now millions and millions of dollars of research and tens of thousands of scientists and uh, peer reviewed journal studies have have come to accept. You know, in the range of two to five degrees Celsius increase. Wow. Yeah, I mean it's. So we've known about this for a long time. It's, it's not that we just. You know, suddenly right. realized even 30, 20, 30 years ago that this was yeah. happening. Yeah, 
Um, that's interesting. Yeah, I would say, you know, the, the impact of this temperature change on our planet, if you, if you really understand it, if you really believe it, there is no other argument that can even come close to not doing everything we can to stop it. Um, and so I really wonder, you know, the folks that, um, that don't think we need to stop burning coal and oil, if they really get the impact of what we're, what we're on the cusp of. Um, we're talking about mass extinctions, famine, drought, it's political unrest, it is scary, scary stuff. Um, let me go back to her and then back to you. Um, well, what if I'm uh, volunteering for conservation folks organization? Some of my supervisors, I think, put it really well. Um, as far as the animals affects um, is that, you know, we can't stop species from dying off as a result, but we can at least try to give them as much time as possible. Mm -hmm. That's a sad scene. Uh, I was just going to ask a lot of what you were talking about. I missed the first 10 minutes or so, so maybe you, you touched on this as well. But a lot of what we were talking about at the end was very local actions and ways for folks to get involved, which I think is absolutely great. We need to be fighting this on all levels. But in terms of a little bit bigger picture in your mind, is there a particular policy um, that could that would be like, you know, our sort of golden ticket to really fight this stuff, either at the national, which we have a little bit more influence over, or international level, and like, what what is the policy that we need to get to to actually make serious, serious progress on this? Well, I think with climate change, the solution isn't a silver bullet, it's a silver buckshot, and we just, we need to do it at all levels. Um, what I love so much about what we're doing here in Washington is we're not only stopping local stuff, but we're changing the international picture as well because we are at this forefront of all these export proposals. Um, I would say that Obama's um, uh, clean, car, clean power plant plan that he's got um, with the EPA um, is going to be a huge thing for us here locally, or nationally, I should say, to shutting down a number of dirty old coal plants. Um, and stopping any new from being built ever again. Um, and then internationally, I would say it's the UN Paris talks this December. Um, and if we can get an international treaty uh, where we, we internationally we're taking steps to have a climate change emission level. The problem with those kind of big policies is that it's extremely hard to get the political will to actually do it at the numbers that you need it. So you get like this really good feel, feel good policy that might not actually do what you need it to do in the time that you needed to do it. I do think that they're good though in that it's, um, once you get something in place, you can start ratcheting it up and making it better and better as you go along. We did that with acid rain um, and you know, um, so I think that getting something in place, even if it's not the perfect, is good, because then we can build from that. But I think that the, the work that's being done, the, the stuff that's actually changing climate change and the carbon emissions, is people working on their one thing in their one neighborhood over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, and then? Oh, I was, I was gonna ask you, you mentioned how you started off as a volunteer. And, oh. And just how, uh, you know, the second part is what can we do and the value and importance of what an individual can do by just showing up, maybe. Mm -hmm. And like at the TPP re uh, resolution at this, just, you know, our yeah. people can make a difference. Maybe they would. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think that that's the only way we've been winning is that we have the people on our side because they have all the money. And so, but we have the people. Um, when we go out to these public hearings, you know, it's, all of us and some really powerful guys in the suits, right? And but we have a lot of power in in that we vote, and uh, and so we could never do what we're doing if it was just us against them in in, in you know suit world. Um, there's no way. There's no way. And it's only because people are challenging their leaders um, to make changes that we are making changes, and so. For instance, you know, these coal export terminals, um, they were supposed to be built already. Um, 
and they haven't even gotten a single permit yet. Um, and it's because of people demanding that we actually do an environmental review, that we have an extensive environmental review, and that people's voices are heard. This was originally the one at Cherry Point up on Lummi Native burial grounds, supposed to be just decided by five county commissioners. That's how it was originally going down. And it was because we stepped in as people and said, no, wait a second. <laughs> this should not be left up to five guys up in Whatcom County, that this is, an, this is an issue that affects all of us. We were able to get the Department of Ecology to step in, and now we're doing a review that really looks at all the impacts of these proposals and not just a small little footprint. Um, and that was only because we had hundreds and thousands of comments and tens of thousands of people coming out to these hearings and stepping up and saying it's not on our watch. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, and now, now there is one calendar you can go to to get all of the upcoming climate-related activities. And if you want to get a weekly update, just sign up on this. And instead of having to search through all your emails <coughs> and those websites. So. Yeah, so kind of moving along with the what can we do with um, and what would help internationally. Is there any like news stories or um, political issues you've heard about from specific countries who are opposing making that international effort? Um, no, I mean it would be China and America. So we're we're the two that cause the problems. Um, <laughs> so if we can go in there in good faith, like they've said that they're going to. Um, I think we're gonna, we have a lot of hope um, because we are the ones that are producing most of the carbon and we're the ones that don't want to change, right? Um, but countries all over the world are saying we got to do something because we're all facing um, huge, huge problems here. Um, and then I would say here at home, you know, we do have a bill in the state legislature to try and get safer oil trains going through. Um, and so if you're interested in calling your senator, um, you can call them at 800-562-6000. And um, you can tell them that you support um, the bill that's moving forward right now. 800-562-6000. And this is the safe oil transportation bill. And then come to our Earth Day event. It's gonna be lots of fun, cool bands. Um, we have the founder of Earth Day coming out to, to speak, so that's kind of neat. Um, and then we also will be having, um, they're not on the flyer, um, but a representative from a group called Got Green, and they have a new um, campaign that they're launching on how to get more jobs in the green economy for young people of color. Um, so they'll be talking about that, and I think that's really interesting, because this is, our opportunity to really not only protect the planet, but to build a more just society as well. Um, I have some information up there on both coal and oil, and then I have a petition if you want to help the Lummi protect their Native American grounds, their burial grounds. They are petitioning right now to have um, the Cherry Point Terminal stop based on their treaty rights. So there's a petition there, and then there's also buttons and bumper stickers if you'd like so. <laughs> Oh yeah, go ahead. Just wondering, um, do you have the numbers that you need to have that before the bill get approved? Mm -hmm. How many people? Well, no. I mean, there's not really an algorithm for that. It's, um, uh, it's just kind of you do as much as you can. I mean, I'll be honest. The, this, so it's gone through the House. Um, it has to go through the Senate, which is a heck of a lot harder. Um, and the folks that are kind of are running the Senate are difficult people. Um, but I think that you know they can be pushed, right? And if they have people paying attention from all over the state on this, um, I think that we can do something. Last year, um, these particular individuals stopped an oil train safety bill from going through. But this year, we're hearing a lot better language coming out of their mouths. And I think it's because of all the explosions and the people really going, hey, come on, you know, this, is, this isn't working. We can't have one of these happen in Seattle. So it, it makes a difference. But yeah, it's hard to say, like, you know, at what number do you saturate it enough? It's, yeah, it's a difficult one to process. Yeah, this is a question on the justice side of this. Um, are organizations 
taking into consideration what happens to people who depend on jobs in the oil and the coal industry, what happens to their families? I mean, there are people who, for many generations, have worked in the coal industry, right? Right. Yeah, oh, I mean, I think it's a huge issue. And um, when we um, work to shut down the Centralia coal plant, we actually work with labor on getting a bill passed that would protect the community, help the workers, and also close down the coal plant. Um, we want to do that as much as possible. Um, those kind of deals are perfect, right? Like I, I would hate that we're hurting, you know, family. Um, I think that in a new, when you're adjusting like this, it is it's difficult. It really is. The the problem that we're having is that it's in a lot of places labor's not willing to come, to come to the table to make these kind of things. They want to fight us, you know, which you can understand. Um, but then when we win, there's nothing kind of there in place. Um, and so Washington is actually a great model for how you can do it. Um, and they fought us and fought us and fought us. And then at the end, they said, OK, let's come together. We see the writing on the wall. Let's come together for something that's better. And now the, the head of the IBUW here in Washington State goes around all over the place talking about how great the Sierra Club is to work with on transitioning to a new energy economy. And he's actually working on bringing a solar farm into Centralia. Um, and we're working with him to help get that. Um, so there is a right way and a wrong way to do this stuff, and, but it takes everybody kind of coming to the table in order to make it happen. But I think that the environmentalists, at least at the Sierra Club, really understand the importance of that um, and want to do as best as we can moving forward. Um, but you know, I think uh, it's not we have, we don't have a perfect track record, uh, but we hope to you know be always improving and making better choices and better decisions on that. Because it's important. Because it's not, it shouldn't be on the back of ordinary people, this transition. Yeah. And in the long run, it helps everyone. That's right. Uh, you know, I mean, certainly, coal workers have suffered with black lung disease and so on. Um, and coal towns are, you know, I mean, you look at Appalachia, it's not like they're <laughs> some kind of booming industry that's bringing a lot of prosperity to their to their world. It's, it's terrible stuff. Um, but there's a lack of anything else. And so that's, you know, an interesting thing of, you know, what do we build instead? Um, and, you know, I think that people like Governor Inslee really need to be looking at that. What are we building instead of these coal ports? Um, and there's some opportunities, like for instance, I'm working with Walken Labor Council up in Bellingham to build a new waterfront redevelopment project there that would bring thousands and thousands of jobs. <coughs> well, you know, one week I'm standing next to the head of it, Mark Lowry, you know, demanding this, and then the, the week after we're fighting each other on the coal board. <laughs> but you know, we at least have a relationship, we have a dialogue, and you know, showing that it's not just about. Um, the environment, it's not about environment versus people. Um, and we have to make the effort to ensure that we are um, working together as much as possible whenever we can. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. If you have your survey, just hand it to me as you walk.